Father, we just ask for your anointing to break through our minds and our spirits tonight in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. I want you to open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. And I'm going to speak to you by the Holy Spirit tonight. And I'm going to begin down a series this on the weekend services for the next number of weeks. Probably what is the most important, significant revelation that I have ever received in my life. It will forever change when you get a hold of it, the perspective you have of life. It will forever free you when you really get a hold of this from being overwhelmed by the circumstances of your life. How many of you have ever wondered how the Apostle Paul could have possibly been in the midst of the circumstances that he was in, shipwrecked and naked and without food and beaten with rods, imprisoned, stoned, and I don't mean drugs, a bunch, bunch of ex-druggies in this church, all right? Well, you got to clarify some things, all right? <laughs> <laughs> stoned and, and flogged, whipped with whips, and yet he says these light and momentary afflictions. Yeah. Have you ever wondered how James and the other apostles who went through such horrific persecution could say, consider it pure joy when you suffer divers temptations and trials? I think sometimes in my early Christian walk, I thought maybe he got hit in the head too often. <laughs> How is this momentary? <laughs> How are these light and momentary afflictions? And, and yet, there is something they got a hold of that I believe most of the modern church does not have a hold of, an understanding and a revelation that forever changed the focus of their mind, the focus of their actions, and changed the perspective of what they were going through at the moment. How many of you know... Your focus affects your perception. I'm going to say that again. Your focus affects your perception. Hmm. Eve, the devil got her to focus on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She all of a sudden felt she was lacking. The entire world, the rest of the entire world belonged to them. She wasn't lacking nothing. She could have spent every different, every meal going to a different tree every single day of her life and never repeat a tree twice. Come on, amen. But your focus changed her perception. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. Now, we've all heard it this way. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But the New King James goes into the original a little bit better on this one. And it says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. The greatest restraining factor in your life to keep you moving towards God is birth in the dimension of the revelation that you have. To the degree that you lack revelation is the degree that you're subject to the influences of the world and the influences of the enemy. I'm going to say that again. To the degree that you lack revelation in your life is the degree that you're subject to the influence of the world and the influence of the enemy. How many of you know, if you really had a full revelation of the glory of God and the glory of heaven, you wouldn't be tempted by the little fleshy things on this earth. Yeah, yeah. If you had a revelation of the mansion you got going on in heaven, you wouldn't be struggling over a few dollars down here on earth. Yeah. Come on, amen. Huh? If you saw the, the fullness of the power of God that is in and for us who believe, you would never be fearful about a bad report from a doctor. 
the degree that we lack revelation leaves us vulnerable to the influence of the world and to the influence and distractions of the enemy. And that is why God says we need to be, we got to be a people of revelation. Everybody say revelation. revelation. <laughs> so when, when, and the problem is where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Hmm. Let me, there's another scripture that says this in the New Testament. It says people that have this hope, talking about the hope of the return of Christ, people that have this hope purify themselves. They purify themselves. They, they, they stop living an ungodly life. Why? Because they have such a focus, such a perspective, such a focus on the coming of Christ that it causes such a depth of revelation that gives them the power to be disciplined. All right, let, let, let me help you out here a little bit here. I know nobody in here ever struggles with, struggles with your weight. Never, not, not in it, never, okay? Not a problem in this church. That's the Baptist. That's us preachers, because you know what we preachers do? We preach, and then we eat. We call it fellowship. I think the Bible calls it gluttony, but that's all right. But if you knew for sure that in 30 days, if you would only eat 1,200 calories a day, and at the end of 30 days, you would be given a check for $10 million. How many know you would find the ability? And I don't know about you, I wouldn't even get close to 1,200 calories. Because I wouldn't want to miss it by one day miscalculating by a few calories. I've been down about 800. I might even think about fasting for 30 days. Because when you have a strong enough vision, you find the ability to restrain yourself. So I believe one of the greatest reasons why we've seen so much sin in the church today and so much weakness in the church today, it's not that there's too much sin, it's there's too little Jesus revealed. And we have lost the focus of what we're supposed to be focused on. Therefore, people haven't come into the breakthrough of the revelation of what this thing is all about. What is God's will for my life? Number one question I hear all over the world when I talk to people, and I mean loving God, going after God, and the number one question I hear time and time and time again is what is God's will for my life? Let me bring that a little higher level. What is the revelation of God for my future? Because if I can clearly see the revelation of God for my future, then it will give me the ability and the strength to discipline myself and restrain myself now. Are y'all hearing me? Shh. If it works so much in the natural, how much in the spirit? If it works for a, a, an Olympic athlete who has such the vision and he sees in his own mind, in his own heart, he sees himself on that stand wearing that gold medal and he's willing to go through years and years and years and years and years of training for the prospect of possibly getting there. How much more so when we get the vision of God in our minds of what God has planned for us, but it's not a possibility. We know that he who began a good work in us shall bring it unto completion. We know that all things work together. We know, Korobah Sunday, we know the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. So what is God's will for my life? Ephesians, and it's different than what you think. It's different than what most of us think. That's why we keep getting all off because we come up with man's concept of the will of God for our lives instead of coming up with the revelation of God. And if you get the wrong vision, you will not have the supernatural power that comes with it to restrain yourself and discipline yourself. Oh, my. Are y'all with me on this? Woo, man, Lord Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 11 from the Amplified. I'm not in a rush on this series. When I take us step by step, Line upon line, precept upon precept, because it's got to break through. If we go too fast, you're going to hear it. You go, amen, but it won't get 
deep on the inside. And it's time it gets deep on the inside. Verse 11 from the Amplified. And his gifts were varied. He himself appointed and gave men to us, some to be apostles, special messengers, some prophets, inspired preachers and expounders, some evangelists, preachers of the gospel, traveling missionaries, some pastors, shepherds of his flock and teachers. His intention, his intention, huh, his intention was that we would get a bunch of big-name preachers with big, fancy cars, and everybody would come and kiss their rings. Yes, sir. That we would have a bunch of Christian superstars. Hmm? That we all could come in and be nothing but spectators in the church and watch the anointed one do his anointed thing so we can get our little blessing and go out and just exist in our lives. No, verse 11. Are those scriptures coming up? Or am I? Okay. Or verse 12, sorry, from the Amplified. His intention was the perfecting and full... Someone say perfecting. perfecting. Put that word deep in your spirit. We're going to come back to that in a few weeks. His intention was the perfecting and full equipping of the saints. His consecrated people, say, that's me, that they should do the work of ministering towards building up Christ's body, the church, that it might develop. Somebody say develop. I want to pause there for a moment because as I read this, your mind may go in a particular direction, but we're going to shift in another direction. We're going to take you beyond praying for the sick, although that's a part of it. We're going to take you beyond teaching and discipling. That's a huge part of it. We're going to take you beyond sharing the gospel with the lost, but that's a part of it. We're going to go beyond moving in the gifts of the Spirit, but that's a part of it. Somebody say that the body might develop. What is this development that God is talking about? What is the body supposed to grow into? What is it maturing to? Somebody say develop, which means it started at an undeveloped, or underdeveloped stage, and it's growing. It's maturing. <laughs> and you are a part of that process. That it might develop until we all attain oneness. in the faith and in the comprehension of the full and accurate knowledge of the Son of God that we might arrive at really mature manhood. <laughs> the completeness, let me say the completeness. completeness. The completeness of personality which is nothing less than the standard height of Christ's own perfection, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ and the completeness found in him. Let me read verse 14. We're going to come back to that in the weeks ahead. So then we may no longer be children. Tossed like ships. Anybody, don't raise your hand. Anybody here feel like you're just getting tossed like a ship all the time? Circumstances knock you this way and something comes and knocks you down. You don't have to raise your hand. You could just say, ouch. Come on. Can, 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 we, can, we, can, we, can we do like Dr. Shirley would say? Can we get the mask off here? 
Oh, I'm sorry. We're in the South. We have big masks. Can we be a little, a little bit New York here and just say it the way it is? <laughs> For those of you that don't know, okay. <laughs> Come on. Can we get the mask off here and be honest that most Christians are constantly being tossed to and fro by every little thing that comes along? Huh? No longer tossed to and fro like ships or tossed like ships to and fro between chance gusts of teachings and wavering with every changing wind of doctrine. Oh, my Lord Jesus. You know how many churches are split because some chance wind of doctrine? Can, I'm going to get I hope you didn't want nice little gentle lead you by the still waters and green pastures. Pastor Steve show up, all right, tonight. Come on. Do you know how many churches are split over the fact they can't decide whether the rapture is in the beginning of the tribulation or the middle of the tribulation or the end of the tribulation? You know how many people split churches over the fact whether we should celebrate the feast or not the feast or whether we should do church on Saturday or church on Sunday? Oh, Brother Steve, that stuff's important. It's not important enough to divide the body of Christ. That's the sign that the church has not grown up. When we can't be intimately, covenantly connected with one another despite radical doctrinal differences. Come on. When I can't spend time with someone who doesn't believe in tongues and they can't spend time with me, we got a problem in the body of Christ. Because whether you speak in tongues and I speak in tongues a lot, whether you speak in tongues or not, does not make any difference when it comes to the first of whether you're saved and going to heaven or not. If you've got faith in the blood of Jesus and you've made him the Lord of your life, that's the only thing I'm concerned about. Huh? And whether you believe once saved, always saved, or you don't believe like that, you know what? Do those things bother you? Yes, they bother me. But the fact is, if you're just living for God, it really doesn't matter. Because if you're still living for him, then you're going to be saved, and you're going to make it to heaven. Hello. Boy, I'm in trouble now. Now watch, and I'm telling you, it's what's going on. Every so then, verse 14 again. So then, we may no longer be taught, be children tossed like ships to and fro between chance gusts of teaching and wavering with every changing wind of doctrine. The prey of cunning and cleverness of unscrupulous men. Gamblers engage in every shifting form of trickery in inventing errors to mislead. Anything they can do to gather a group to themselves so they can feel like they're a somebody, they don't care about the damage. I'm in trouble right now. They don't care about the damage they're causing to the body of Christ just as long as they can have their own little circle that believes just like them and it makes them feel superior like they've tapped into some revelation. Let me tell you something. If you've really tapped into revelation, you'll tap into the first revelation that the body is his body, not yours. And any doctrine that separates you, any revelation, quote, unquote, that separates you from the rest of the real body of Christ isn't a revelation from God. God doesn't reveal something to you that divides himself. Oh, my Lord. I'm, come on. I'm in trouble now. She cut on my Sunday. See, the problem is failure to understand the purpose of God in our lives leaves us vulnerable to the cunning, to cunning and unscrupulous men. When we fail to understand the plans and the purposes of God, 
when we fail to understand the ultimate intention of why God even did this thing? Why did he even create man? Why did he create the earth? Why did he put us in the garden? Why, when Adam and Eve sinned, did he start a redemption process? And why did he come down? Why did he send his son? Why did he die on the cross? Why was he raised from the dead? Why is he coming back for us? What is this thing really all about? Is it simply about us just having a good life? Is it simply about, come on, Jesus did not come just to forgive you of your sins. He didn't come just to get you out of hell. He didn't come even just to get you into heaven. He didn't come just to get you a mansion so you can walk on streets of gold. He didn't come just so you could get a crown. He didn't even come just so you could spend eternity worshiping him for all of eternity. He came for a greater purpose. got to get this tonight. Father, I give you praise. Jesus' primary purpose for coming and dying on the cross was not the forgiveness of your sins. I am not minimizing that. He could have never fulfilled his primary purpose without the forgiveness of your sins. But that wasn't it. He came for a much greater purpose than that. He came for an eternal purpose. Everybody say eternal purpose. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. Are you all with me tonight? Father, I give you praise. Shaka Rama Sunday. Shaka Rama Sunday. Hey, hey. Go ahead and pray in tongues for about 20 seconds. Shahande. Shaka Rama Sunday. Rebe Shaka Dande. Shiri Andarabaka Rama Shaka Rama Sunday. Shaka Rama Sunday. Sunday Rebe Karama Sunday. Somebody say this after me. God wants me to know his eternal purpose. Say it again. God wants me to know his eternal purpose. Ephesians 1.9. Lord, help me. Woo. Making, there is such a spirit of revelation here tonight. <laughs> and I'm going to pray for you tonight. I'm going to pray for you. You're going to get something tonight. I said you're going to get something tonight. Ha, huh. ha, huh. okay, maybe about four of you. The rest of you are kind of staring at me. That's all right. That's all right. Let me tell you something. What we're entering into, what we're entering into, nobody can force you into. You have to want it. <clears throat> Making known to us the mystery, Ephesians 1, 9 from the Amplified. Making known to us the mystery, the secret of his will of his plan, and of his purpose. And it is this, in accordance with his good pleasure, his merciful intention, which he had previously purposed and set forth in him. Someone say it's God's will, it's God's will. to make known, to make known. The, mystery of his plan. the mystery of his plan. God does not want you to be ignorant. I'm telling you, please, Forgive me for keep saying it, but I'm going to keep saying it. These next few weeks are the most important series of revelations we have ever brought at this church. It will change the way you view life forever. And I believe when you get a hold of it, it will free you from the struggles of being knocked around by the circumstances of your life. You're no longer going to be wondering and wavering. You're no longer going to be vulnerable to the cunning, deceitful, unscrupulous strategies of the enemy. You're not going to be tossed back and forth any longer. Am I talking to somebody here tonight? Jesus, Shahande. John 16, 13. Say it after me. God does not want me to be ignorant. John 
16, 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Say it again. God does not want me to be ignorant. He's not just going to tell you the things to come here on the earth. He's going to tell of you of the things to come in the eternal purpose of God for your life. <laughs> Woo Amos 3, 7. Woo. I want you to memorize this scripture. Surely the Lord God does nothing. Can you say that word nothing? nothing. Come on, can you say that word nothing? nothing? Surely the Lord God does nothing except he reveals his, his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Let me drop a bomb in your spirit. Truth is power. Bible says ye shall know the truth. And the truth has such power that it will make you free. It's not just set free, it's made free. The difference between being set free and made free is if an animal gets caught in an animal trap, you can set it free, but it can fall back into the same kind of trap again. But when you're made free, you'll never fall in that trap ever again. just that see that's the problem we got a lot of deliverance services going on where people are getting set free yeah. we cast out the devils we lay hands on them and they temporarily get set free but a year later they're back in the same problem again why because they didn't get enough revelation of the truth that made them free oh my father Shh. <laughs> Go back to Ephesians 1, 9 again from the Amplified, 1, 9 and 10. Whew. Making known to us the mystery, the secret of his will, of his plan, of his purpose. And it is this, in accordance with his good pleasure, his merciful intention, which he previously purposed and set forth in him, he planned. For the maturity of the times <laughs> and the climax of the ages. Someone say God planned for the end times. He planned to do something in the end times that he had never done yet in all of history. <laughs> I don't know about you, but how many believe Jesus is coming soon? Come on, anybody here believe we're living in the end times? He planned for the maturity of the times and the climax of the ages to unify all things and head them up and consummate them in Christ, both things in heaven and things on the earth. Someone say, God plan. God plan. Ephesians 1, 17, a few verses later, from the Amplified. <laughs> you don't mind me getting you a lot of word tonight, do you? Huh? Shika dan. I know this church is out there. They barely sneak one scripture in in a half an hour. Shoo. I got about 15 today, so. Why? Because my cute stories won't bring transformation. 
It might be an illustration, but the Word is what brings transformation, the revelation of truth. Someone say revelation. Say it again. Say revelation. Come on. We got, we got something in the church has got to change. We got to stop having nice messages. We got to stop even having simple little Bible studies. Something's got to shift. Something's got to change. There needs to come a spirit of revelation upon the church that our eyes begin to be open and we begin to see into the mysteries and secrets of God. Ephesians 1.17 from the Amplified. For I always pray to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that he may grant you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. <laughs> Someone say revelation. revelation. Of insight into mysteries and secrets in the deep and intimate knowledge of him by having your head filled with a bunch of doctrine and cute stories by being entertained by a bunch of corny videos and Pyrotechnics. Huh? <laughs> By having the eyes of your heart flooded. Flooded. Flooded with light. Somebody say flooded with light. Second Corinthians chapter four. Father, I give you praise. Shikara ma Sunday. Shikara ma Sunday. Shinde. Ha ha ande. Verse six. Second Corinthians chapter four. Verse 6, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Someone say the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Ephesians 1.18 by having the eyes of your heart flooded with light. With what? The light of the revelation of the glory of God. Wow, wow. Yeah. Now, yeah. Karama Sunday. How are you going to walk? How is God going to fill you with the spirit of wisdom and revelation? How is he going to give you mystery, revelation into the mysteries and secrets and the neat, deep and intimate knowledge of him by flooding the eyes of your heart, by flooding your mind, your will, your emotions, your imaginations with the revelation of the fullness of the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Come on. We're not talking about mental ascent here. We're not talking about just getting ourselves into positive thinking or encouraging ourselves. We're talking about having an encounter with God to where our minds are literally flooded with the revelation of the light. The light. The light. Oh, caramba. Someone say the light. I got I to gotta switch mics here because I, I got to. Come on, go to Hebrews chapter 1 from the Amplified. Shakara Masande. Shakara Masande. Ephesians. Can I preach a little revelation here tonight? Shikara my Sunday. You say, Brother Steve, I'm a little lost. I'm not quite getting it. Just pray softly in the Holy Ghost, and God will anoint you with the spirit of interpretation. 
Now, you didn't hear what I just said there. You didn't hear what I just said there. You don't understand the power of praying in tongues. You think tongues and interpretation is just for you to stand up at a service and give a message? Tongues and interpretation. When you speak in tongues, the Bible says, he who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto man. He speaks unto God. For what does he do? He's uttering the mysteries. He's, my God, on my Sunday. The mysteries. Come on, are you hearing that? And what did we just pray? That God would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation of insight into mysteries and secrets. Somebody say, my eyes of my understanding flooded with light. Flooded with light. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 from the Amplified. Hebrews 1, 3 from the Amplified says this. He, Jesus, is the sole expression of the glory of God. The light being, <laughs> the outraying or radiance of the divine. And he is the perfect imprint and the very image of God's nature, upholding and maintaining and guiding and propelling the universe by his mighty word of power. Somebody say he's the light being. He's the outraying. He's the visible manifestation of the glory of God. Now he's praying that you're the eyes in Ephesians 1, 18 from the Amplified by having the eyes of your heart flooded with that dimension of the light of the knowledge of the glory of God as revealed in the face of Jesus. God never intended for you just to go to church and hear a nice little encouraging message. He intended for you to have continual progressive revelation upon revelation from one degree of what glory to another. It's all right to talk in tongues. It's all right to talk in tongues. Watch this. By having the, uh, verse 18, by having the eyes of your heart flooded with light. Why? So that you can know and understand the hope to which he has called you. What are you saying, Brother Steve? I'm saying that until our minds and our hearts begin to be flooded with the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, we will never truly understand the eternal hope to which God has called us. As long as we're in that spiritual condition, that low level of spiritual condition, we are robbed of functioning in the faith that will change this world. Because faith is the substance of, Of things hoped for. And if we don't know the hope to which we are called to, we have nothing for our faith to really attach itself to. Shikatende. That word faith. It says it's the substance. Faith is the substance. That word substance comes from a Greek word, hypostasis. 
It literally speaks of the under support that keeps everything firm. We cannot, no wonder, please, I hope you're getting this tonight. I hope I'm not going too fast. No wonder so many people are tossed to and fro by every chance wind of doctrine because we've had so little revelation of the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is revealed in the face of Jesus. Therefore, we're not able to function in faith when I'm able to stand firm and stand strong and having done all to stand. Instead, we're being knocked all over the place because we're trying to figure out what is my purpose for life and what is God's will and what am I supposed to do and where am I supposed to go and what am I, how am I supposed to live and this one says this and this preacher says that. It was never supposed to predominantly come from what some preacher or what some church said. It was supposed to come from a personal intimate revelation of who Jesus is. Shikarama Sunday. Shiri Anera my Sunday. I tell you, it's the plan and purpose of God that you get more revelation outside of church than you ever do inside of church because you're walking in such a divine relationship under the spirit of wisdom and revelation that He keeps unveiling layer after layer of His glory to you. Someone say the devil's a liar. Say God doesn't want me ignorant. Come on, say it with some force. God doesn't want me ignorant. Not prophesy to you in the name of Jesus that there's a new anointing coming upon the body of Christ that is going to give God's people eyes to see into the spirit realm to understand the mysteries and secrets of God. You can't change yourself. You can't transform yourself. God never intended for you to change yourself. God never intended for you to transform yourself. Man's been trying to do that since man fell in the garden. Man is incapable of changing himself. But when we have an encounter with the glory of God. Oh, my Father God, my Father God. Huh? Come on, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 from the Amplified. Someone say, the devil's a liar. Say it again, say, devil, you're a liar. Say it again, devil, you're a liar. I'm telling you, we're heading into the most important series we've ever done in this church. I'm barely getting through the first part of my introduction. I want you to understand, I haven't even begun to share with you the revelation yet. Are you hearing me? I don't, I'm not even going to get there this week. I'm just going to, we just got to get you repositioned so you're under an anointing to receive the revelation. Oh, my God, my God, my God. Come on, don't think, do, don't you think for one minute God raised this church up to be some nice little community center. Thank God for that. I don't criticize that at all. But that's not what God brought you here for. That's not what God raised us up here for. God has raised this place up to reestablish the foundations of his temple that the glory may once again fill his temple. And we're not going to back off of the purpose. Shikarama Sunday, Shahande. Shande be karama Sunday. Shande. Someone say, Pastor Steve, you've been different all year. What's going on? 2012 is our year of harvest. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And all of us 
as with unveiled face because we continue to behold in the word of God. Someone say Jesus. As in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are constantly being transfigured into his very own image. In ever-increasing splendor, from one degree of glory to another. Can I drop a couple bombs in your spirit real quick? First off, no matter how incredible a breakthrough is, no matter how amazing a move of God is, don't ever buy into the lie that this is the final move. It ain't the final move until everything that we are, the natural is shed off, and we are nothing but in the per pure, perfect image of Christ. You say, well, it's amazing, brother. Steve. Yes, it is. It's just a glory unto the next glory. Unto the next glory, unto the next glory, unto the next. He said that word transfigured. Morphe. It's the Greek word. It's only used three times in the Bible. It's used when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration. And all of a sudden his garments became white. And they saw. Are you ready for this? I don't know if I could take you here tonight. I don't know. Come on. I don't know if you're ready to handle this much revelation. They saw an outward visible. Someone say visible. They saw an outward visible. Visible manifestation of who he was on the inside. Some would say outward manifestation. Remember what we read in Hebrews. He was the light being, the outraying of the divine. Colossians tells us he was the visible manifestation of the invisible God. Jesus said to Philip, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Someone say Jesus was the visible manifestation of the glory of God. Now, as we continue to behold him in his glory, we are being transfigured. We are being transfigured. What's happening? The glory that was born on the inside of you because you were born of an incorruptible seed. The Father is in you. The Holy Spirit is in you. Jesus is in you. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. But as we continue to behold in the mirror the glory of the Lord, as the eyes of our heart and our understanding are flooded with the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is revealed in the face of Jesus, a supernatural transformation process begins to take place. And we begin to outwardly manifest visibly, visibly, no, 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 no. visibly. Visibly, shakarama. No, I'm not talking about the preacher. I'm talking about you. Visibly, you're going to begin to visibly, outwardly manifest Jesus. I told you I didn't think they were ready for it. Somebody say visible. Say it again. Say visible. What do you think's going to happen? What do you think's going to happen if when Moses, under the old covenant, 
saw the glory of God up on Mount Sinai. So when he came down from seeing the glory, he literally physically shined. Somebody say visible. Say it again, say visible. What do you think is going to happen to us who have a blood covenant with Jesus, who the veil has been stripped away, who can see a dimension of God that even Moses wasn't allowed to see? What do you think is going to happen to us? Come on, haven't you ever seen anybody come out of an incredible encounter with God or an incredible season of prayer and you, 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 like, you look at them? Have you ever seen it? It's like you're glowing. You're like, we're just seeing the faintest manifestations of what is about to be so strong. You're not hearing me tonight. You're not hearing me tonight. You're going to begin to reflect the glory of God. Why do you think the old paintings always showed halos around the saints? Where did they come up with that idea? They saw something. They saw something. They, there was something different. There was something Whether it's visibly manifested in the natural or just so radiant in the spirit, but people are going to see it. Oh, my father, my father, my father, Sunday. Shh, someone say visible. The visible manifestation of the invisible God. Robert, if you'll come, help me out here. Play some stop preaching music. Shh. Psalms 91. Let me give you a couple more scriptures real quick here. I lost some of you there. That's all right. Someone say, God never intended for me to be ignorant. Never intended for me not to know his will for my life. This end time church is going to be different than anything the world has ever seen. And you're called by God to be a part of it. Say, well, Brother Steve, you don't understand how weak I feel. That's why God's going to get all the glory. Because when God raises you up out of obscurity and takes you out of your weakness, even the angels are going to stop and look down and ponder, how is it that God could raise them up? And you know what's going to happen? You're going to give God all that much more glory. You're going you're to make sure he's the only one that gets praised over it. Because you know better than anybody else, this wasn't by my might nor by my strength, but by his spirit. Psalm 91 verse 1 He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High Shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty Daniel 2.28 But there is a God in heaven Who reveals secrets Jeremiah 24.7 Then I will give them a heart to know me <laughs> I will, I will give them a heart to my God. Someone say revelation. That I am the Lord and they shall be my people and I will be their God. For they shall return to me with their whole heart. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor hath entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But... God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. 
For the Spirit searches the things of God. Yes, the deep things of God. Someone say the deep things of God. Say it again. Say the deep things of God. I'm telling you, church, in the name of Jesus, it's time we get beyond shallow Christianity. It's time we get simply beyond trying to figure out how to overcome some temptations. It's time we get beyond trying to figure out how to just get our needs met or even how to just get our bodies healed. It's time we begin to come into the fullness of the revelation of the light of the knowledge of the glory of God so we can begin to enter into our eternal destiny and purpose. Oh, shakara my Sunday.